Lady Geraldine's Speech by Beatrix Harridan. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Characters Dr. Alice Romney, a medical woman. Read by Devora Allen. Lady Geraldine Boleyn, Dr. Alice Romney's school friend. Read by Kelly Taylor. Miss Gertrude Silberthwaite, an eminent artist. Read by the Story Girl. Miss Nora Bailey, a professor of literature. Read by T.J. Burns. Miss Hilda Crowninshield, a famous pianist. Read by Jen Broda. Miss Nellie Grant, a typist and shorthand writer. Read by Avayi. Jane, a maid. Read by Skirbo. Stage directions. Read by Todd. Scene. Dr. Alice Romney's drawing room in Nottingham Place. It is her fortnightly suffrage at home day. She is seated at her writing desk near the window. She is of middle stature and has a strong, capable face. Enter maid with card. A lady asks specially to see you. I said you were engaged until three o'clock, but she insisted. Dr. Alice, looking at card and smiling. Show her in, Jane. Enter hurriedly, shown in by maid, the Lady Geraldine Boleyn. Oh, my dear, how good of you to see me. I hope I am not interrupting any operation. Not that I suppose you perform operations in drawing rooms, but I had to see you instantly, whatever you were doing. I've dashed up purposely from Eastbourne. The fact is, Alice, I've got myself into a most awful hole. You will help me out, won't you? You always have helped me out of my difficulties. Nothing more than you ought to have done, considering how I used to come to your rescue over your French compositions in the dear old Cheltenham College days. My word, you were bad at French, weren't you? Dr. Alice, nodding. Yes, and I'm not much better now. Languages were always a trial to me. I used to think you were a perfect wonder over them. So I was, so I am um, still. Don't let there be any mistake about that. Well, now to business. As I told you, I've got myself into a most fearful scrape. The worst in my life. Absolutely the worst. Geraldine, Geraldine, what on earth have you been up to? Are you never going to learn discretion? Apparently never. There's no doubt that I have committed a terrible indiscretion. I have compromised myself with, well, I hardly like to tell you, with the Women's National Anti-Suffrage League. Dr. Alice, brightening up. Is that all? Isn't it enough in all conscience? I'm at my wit's end. I haven't slept for nights, for years. Look at how drawn my face is. And if I'm not careful, I shall begin to look clever. Yes, I've gotten into the toils of the National Anti-Suffrage League. I've been made into a president or vice president or honorary secretary or supporter of something of the sort. And I have to take the chair at a large meeting at the Imperial Hall next week and make a speech and use all the anti-suffrage arguments on this wretched sheet of paper. Oh, where is it? Looking for it in her muff and satchel. Ah. Here it is. It's like a nightmare to me. Every time I try to look at it, all the letters seem to chase each other off the paper, and there's only a blank left, like my brain. If you won't help me, I shall perish. I know I shall. But, my dear Geraldine, I'm a suffragist, a suffragette, a militant. You've come to the wrong person. Lady Geraldine, coaxingly. I've come to my old school chum, as if being a suffragist or an anti-suffragist could make any difference to that eternal fact. No, you're right. Well, what do you want me to do? 
I want you to write my speech for me and coach me up in it. There, don't look so disagreeable. You're so handsome when you're pleasant, and so hideous when you're cross. Ah, that's better. Now, here are some of the arguments. As I told you, I tried to glance at them, but failed. So I haven't really gone into the details. I haven't really gone into the matter at all between you and me. But... Suddenly recollecting herself. I felt strongly on general lines that it was impossible for me to take the responsibility of being in favor of woman's suffrage. How well you roll those words out. Someone has made you learn that sentence by heart. But I felt strongly, on general lines, that it was impossible for me to take the responsibility of being in favor of women's suffrage. I must say, I wonder you dare take the still greater responsibility of being against it. Lady Geraldine, waving her hand in dismissal of Dr. Alice's remark. Come now, Alice, do begin. We're wasting time. Allow me to conduct you to your desk. Here's paper, and here's your stylo. And here am I, waiting on you, as usual. Oh, you can make as much fun of me as you like, and lecture me as much as you like. I was always good-tempered, wasn't I? I don't mind what you say to me, as long as you help me with my speech. Why don't you go and get an anti-suffragist friend to do this for you? My dear girl, don't be ridiculous. With a few notable and unreachable exceptions, all the anti-suffragists have my sort of brains. How can we possibly help each other? Do begin. I'm losing my patience with you. But you have heaps of splendid men amongst you. Go to them. Certainly not. It's one thing to sing small about your sex, but quite another thing to sing small about yourself. Except to a dear old school chum who used to be a regular old brick, but evidently isn't one any longer. I never dreamed that you would fail me. What on earth shall I do? I shall make an awful fiasco and disgrace myself and my cause, and it will be your fault. You wouldn't wish to see me humiliated, would you? And surely you wouldn't wish my cause to be disgraced. You've always said causes saved one. Those have been your very words, Alice. Causes saved one. It did not matter what they were. <laughs> Nothing could ever save you. You're spoiled through and through. Here, give me the precious arguments. Sit down by the fire and don't chatter for a minute or two, and I'll see what I can do for you. Lady Geraldine, taking up her skirt and dancing round a little. Aha! I knew she would come round. These grim people are always the easiest to deal with. Be sure and write clearly, dear. I never could read your handwriting. She dances into a chair and sits primly up, twiddling her fingers. A pause. I think you might begin in this way. Ladies and gentlemen, I am here tonight to explain to you some of the weighty reasons which have decided me, after much anxious thought and study, to become a determined opponent of woman's suffrage. Excellent! Sounds as if I'd studied the question for untold centuries, doesn't it? Then I think you'd better touch at once on the unwomanliness of the whole movement, and the danger to the home. And you might enlarge on the harem theme. The harem theme? What's that? I don't remember that on the list. Not that I remember anything. It is not called that. It's called the immense indirect influence now possessed by women. To me, personally, a most degrading influence. After that, you might beat the imperial drum. The imperial? The door opens. Enter, unannounced, Miss Gertrude Silverthwaite, an eminent artist. She is charmingly dressed and has an engaging personality. Ah, busy, I see, Dr. Alice. I'm rather early. Shall I go away and come back in half an hour or so? No, no. Sit down by the fire with my friend. An old school friend. I'm throwing together a speech for her. She's a new hand. I don't mind you talking, as long as you don't talk to me. Lady Geraldine and Gertrude Silverthwaite, who have already greeted, settle down together. 
Dr. Alice has a most enviable gift of concentration. She can study the most abstruse subject under any conditions whatsoever. So she is helping you with your first speech. Well, you couldn't have anyone better to help you. She's so splendid at arranging the arguments in their most forceful fashion. Shall you be nervous? Lady Geraldine, uneasily. Yes. Ah, well, we all have to go through that. But it's worthwhile for the sake of the cause, isn't it? Lady Geraldine, doubtfully. Yes. I'm just painting Dr. Alice's portrait. A difficult face. So handsome when she's pleasant, and so ugly when she's disagreeable. That's exactly what I say, my very words a few minutes ago. Then you are an artist, a portrait painter. May I ask your name? I am so interested in pictures. Silberthwaite. Lady Geraldine, enraptured. Gertrude Silberthwaite, you don't mean it. I am proud and delighted to see you. I have always wanted to meet you, but one never comes across to you anywhere. I always heard you were a recluse. Gertrude Silberthwaite, smiling. I'm not by nature a society bird. And, moreover, I haven't much spare time. None, in fact. But the suffrage movement has brought us all professional women out of our libraries and studios and all our other hiding places. We had to take our share in it, or else be ashamed of ourselves. I really do think it is a wonderful movement, don't you? And quite apart from anything to do with the vote itself, it is so splendid coming in intimate contact with a lot of fine women all following different professions or businesses. That's one of our advantages over the anti-suffragists, isn't it? They have no means of understanding personally the inner meaning of the whole movement. I'm sorry for them, aren't you? Lady Geraldine, fervently. Yes, for some of them. Do you know I'm planning to paint a suffrage picture for next year's Academy? A group of representative suffragist women. Ellen Terry for the drama, Mrs. Garrett Anderson for medicine... Mrs. Ayrton for science, Miss Elizabeth Robbins for literature, Christabel Pankhurst for politics, and... Enter Miss Nora Bailey, a professor of literature and a brilliant lecturer. She is particularly fresh-looking and has a fine, enthusiastic face with eyes far apart. What, Dr. Alice Busy? Making out prescriptions? Ah, uh, no, I see you haven't got the prescription look on your face. A letter to the Prime Minister, perhaps. A love letter to the Home Secretary. A valentine to the Governor of Holloway. Who can tell? Anything may happen in these days. Gertrude Silverthwaite, laughing and beckoning to Bailey. <laughs> Don't talk to her, Miss Bailey. She's concocting a speech. Come and talk to us instead. You do look in splendid form this afternoon. What have you been doing? I've just given the best Chaucer lecture I've ever given in my life. And the class was magnificent. Heavens, what a difference it makes when you know you have your class with you. Chaucer, how interesting. I haven't heard his name mentioned since I was at school. Do tell me something about him. Nora Bailey, quoting with animation. His stature was not very tall. Lean he was, his legs were small. Hosed within a stock of red, a buttoned bonnet on his head. His beard was white, trimmed round, his countenance blithe and merry found. Huh! I wonder whether Chaucer would have conceded us the vote. I have my doubts. But I have no doubt about Shakespeare, none. I can't conceive it possible that he who gave us Portia, Hermione, Cordelia, Rosalind, Beatrice, Imogene, and all his other splendid women of brain, education, and initiative would have withheld us grudgingly the rights of full citizenship? I intend to die in the belief that he would have been on our side. I'm sure he's on the platform at all suffrage meetings, calling out inaudibly, "'Votes for Women!' 
turning to Lady Geraldine. Don't you agree with me? I've never thought of it. Nor have I, but I dare say she's right. Of course I'm right. What a pity the Prime Minister hasn't got Shakespeare's mind. There's no denying he hasn't, is there? Lady Geraldine, pensively. I suppose there isn't. You appear to be in some doubt. Oh, oh no, not about that. But I was just wondering. Enter Miss Hilda Crowninshield, a famous pianist. Ah, oh, here's Hilda Crowninshield. Hurrah! Hilda Crowninshield, greeting them all. Here I am, just back from a concert at Manchester. Good afternoon, Dr. Alice. Busy, I see. Turning to Gertrude Silverthwaite. What is she doing? Shall I disturb her if I try the piano? Oh, dear, no. She's only writing a speech. As long as you don't talk to her, you may introduce the whole of the Queen's Hall Orchestra into this room, and she won't turn a hair. Good. I want to run through the two little Brahms pieces I promised to play this afternoon. If the piano is very much out of tune, and there are more than five or six notes broken, I shall have to choose some other things, that's all. She sits down at the piano. Lady Geraldine, who has been exceedingly stirred by her arrival, goes up to her. Lady Geraldine, excitedly. Miss Crowninshield, I must speak to you. I cannot tell you what your playing means to me. I'd rather hear you than anyone in the world. I don't know what you do to me. When I hear you play, I feel myself capable of everything great and good. Hilda Crowninshield, greatly pleased, and touching her gently on the hand. Thank you. Then you must be passionately fond of music? Passionately. It is the language I understand. Hilda Crowninshield, beginning to touch the notes. Ah, not so bad. And I declare Dr. Alice has had it tuned. I never expected such luck. Yes, I can play one or two of Brahms' Intermezzi, and perhaps a Chopin waltz, perhaps even a bit of Grieg. She addresses herself to Lady Geraldine. Yes? Yes, yes. How good of you to come and play at Dr. Alice's. Good? Why, I love playing to my suffrage comrades. I'd do anything for them. Play the trombone if they wanted it fearfully. She begins Brahms' first intermezzo. After she has been playing for a little while, enter Nellie Grant, a typist and shorthand writer. She carries, slung over her shoulder, a bag with one remaining copy of Votes for Woman. She looks extremely fatigued. Hilda Crowninshield glances up and leaves off playing and joins the others. Why, my dear child, you look worn out thoroughly at the end of yourself. Let's ring for tea for her immediately. They ring for tea. Tired, but very proud, Miss Crowninshield. I've had a most successful day. Sold all my votes for women, except one solitary copy, and had some useful little talks with lots of people. One man bought six copies. He said he had been an ante until yesterday, when he went to an anti-meeting and that converted him. <laughs> Bravo! Runs to the piano and plays a few bars of the waltz from The Merry Widow. They laugh, clap, and dance a little. I really do think the aunties are our best friends. Why? I don't quite understand. I should have thought they were very formidable foes. Oh dear, no. You needn't have any fears about that. You see, with a few exceptions, they can't speak. They haven't had the practice. They haven't learned how to hold an audience. But when they have learned, what then? Even then, they can't be formidable. Remember for your comfort that they haven't got an irresistible champion as we have. Lady Geraldine, entirely mystified. An irresistible champion? She means the spirit of the age. Lady Geraldine, smiling blankly. The spirit of the age? And lots of them haven't gone into it. I know they haven't. One of them brought me the anti-suffrage petition to sign and told me quite frankly, when I advanced some arguments in favor of women's suffrage, that she had not gone into it. 
but that she wanted to get as many signatures as quickly as possible for that petition, which was sent in yesterday, you know. Seven miles long or seven feet high, I forget which. They may get signatures, whole villages of signatures, but they can't really hope to influence people if they haven't taken the trouble to influence themselves, can they? No. Don't give them one anxious thought. They'll soon fold their tents like the Arabs and as silently steal away. Hilda Crowninshield, who is still at piano, improvises and sings softly. The night shall be filled with music and the cares which beset the day shall fold their tents like the Arabs and as silently steal away. Tea is brought in. Lady Geraldine, who has been slowly gathering herself together for a declaration of faith. I have something to tell you all. You've been taking it for granted that I'm a suffragist. Well, I'm not. I'm an anti-suffragist. Mm, great heavens! How delightful! I've been longing to meet one face to face. No one brought me the anti-suffrage petition. Do tell us your name. Who are you? Geraldine Boulin. Nora Bailey, turning to the others. Why, of course. Lady Geraldine Boleyn. She's going to take the chair on the 15th at the Imperial Hall. Surely I'm not mistaken. Yes, that's quite right. And as I couldn't manage my speech, I came to my old school friend in my distress. I know it sounds absurd, but it's true. Dr. Alice looking up for the first time from her desk. Idiot, why did you give yourself away? I could shake you. Alice, I simply couldn't have held out a moment longer. I couldn't have gone on pretending by my silence that I was one of them. Dr. Alice getting up from her desk and turning fiercely to her comrades. You mustn't betray her. I wouldn't have her betrayed for worlds. She's very dear to me. She has always been wonderfully good to me, though she has been a great nuisance at times and has given me a lot of trouble and has always made the most unreasonable demands on me, and, well, I've liked it. She's my oldest and dearest school friend, and we plotted all sorts of mischief together in the happy old days, and if that isn't a sacred bond, then nothing is. Nearly all the pleasures I had in my holidays came through her. I should never have known all the sweet pleasures of the country but for her, joys which abide with one forever when other things have passed out of one's life. I can't and won't have her humiliated. If I hadn't helped her over her speech, she would have probably made herself ridiculous. And I couldn't have stood that. I had to help her. And I shall always have to help her. If she becomes an anarchist and takes the chair at an anarchist meeting, I shall have to write her speech for that, too. I... Promise me you won't give her away. Of course. How oh, word of honor. honor. They all stretch out their hands to Lady Geraldine and make a charming group round her. There's nothing, however, in our oath to prevent us from laughing a little, is there? <laughs> oh, and to think I shan't be able to go and heckle you. I can't heckle Dr. Alice's old school friend. <laughs> and I bought a ticket surreptitiously. <laughs> and with the utmost difficulty. <laughs> As I told you, I've never seen a real anti-suffragist before. Do let me paint your portrait. Side face would be best, I think. I'm not quite sure, though. No, it must be full face. Yes, full face. Do tell me if it's true that there's going to be a No Votes for Women paper with a Union Jack on the cover. I shall be jealous. Hilda Crowninshield, taking Lady Geraldine's arm. Don't you dare tease her any more. Votes or no votes, she and I speak the same language, don't we? Well, now for the speech, Geraldine. I've quite enjoyed this little job. I'm rather pleased with it. I think I've brought in all the points. Degradation of womanhood. Degradation and disintegration of entire empire. Dominant female vote in all matters concerning the army and navy. Our relations with foreign powers, with our colonies, and with India. 
physical force argument. Women have to safeguard the past and the future, and it is the men's work to look after the present. I don't myself know what that means, but it sounds well. Absolute denial that the vote will improve the economic position of women. Indirect influence of women quite sufficient. Emphatic, nay, passionate insistence on your own brainlessness, that is very important. A few passing allusions to us suffragists as obscure vulgarians. I think you might almost call us uneducated. Yes, uneducated and obscure vulgarians. That also sounds well. And as there's so little to say, it must sound well, my dear girl, or else the cause perishes. Ah, yes, and you mustn't forget to refer to yourselves as so-called traitresses to the sex, so-called survivals of the Dark Ages, because that will elicit respectful sympathy. And be sure and mention that you have joined the Territorial Nursing Corps. I forget its name, but that's near enough. Have you joined it, by the way? Lady Geraldine, who is standing all this splendidly, no. Then do so at once, because that's a piece of subtle cleverness. You disclaim physical force, and yet are preparing indirectly to defend your country. There now. Haven't I been a brick? Haven't I wiped out forever the obligation of those French compositions? Lady Geraldine, with spirit but good temper. No, that obligation could never be wiped out. And besides, this service doesn't count. Do you know what I'm going to do with this speech? Look. She throws it into the fire. Well, of all the ungrateful, aristocratic little wretches. Lady Geraldine, with increased spirit and charm, turning to the others. Do you know what I'm going to do next? I'm going home to think. Impossible. You've never done such a thing in your life. Shame, Dr. Alice. It's never too late to sin. Uh, I mean, to think. <laughs> Lady Geraldine, smiling at her. I should love to come to one of your lectures. May I? Of course you may. Lady Geraldine, to Gertrude Silverthwaite. And will you really paint my portrait? Of course I will. Full face, and when you're thinking. Lady Geraldine, to Hilda Crowninshield. The same language, votes or no votes? Yes, yes. Lady Geraldine, to Nelly Grant. Will you let me have your last remaining copy of your paper? Here it is, Lady Geraldine, a present from us all. Thank you. Goodbye, all of you. Goodbye. She goes to the door. When she has reached it, she turns round to Dr. Alice. There is a roguish look on her face. Alice, how long do mumps take? Oh, about two or three weeks. Very infectious, aren't they? Highly. I believe I've got them already. Afraid I shan't be able to take that chair. Goodbye. She goes out. They look after her for a moment. Dr. Alice fiercely. Mind, if you betray my school chum, I'll never speak to you again. Betray one of our own, Dr. Alice? For she's one of our own already. Before many weeks are past, she'll be selling votes for women in a blinding snowstorm in the merry month of May. Nora Bailey, raising her teacup. Her health. They drink her health. Curtain. End of Lady Geraldine's Speech by Beatrix Harridan.